In the depths of my memory, there's an unsettling recollection from my seventh grade year. A class field trip to Ripley's Aquarium of the Smokies near Gatlinburg, Tennessee, seemed like an ordinary day in the mountains, a seemingly dull destination for our science class. Mr. Russo, our relaxed science teacher, was our chaperone. He was more laid back than the other teachers, and his easygoing nature allowed my friend Aiden and me to discreetly escape the main group. It was Mr. Russo's lackadaisical approach that enabled us to slip away from the aquarium's bustling lobby. Impatient, we decided not to wait for the rest of the groups. The whole place was eerily vacant, devoid of any visitors but our classmates. As we ventured through the passageways leading to various observationaries, we reveled in the emptiness, savoring the unobstructed views of the enormous fish tanks and exhibits. Each darkened room was bathed in a soft, ethereal blue glow, a result of the vibrant marina life. Amidst our light-hearted exploration, we couldn't resist making jokes about the fish, particularly the familiar characters from Finding Nemo. The clownfish and the forgetful, dory fish. But our casual escapade took a sinister turn when we heard a commanding voice piercing the silence. A man, dressed in cargo shorts and a green t-shirt, sternly inquired if we were part of the field trip. Though I was inclined to say no, Aiden replied affirmatively. The man, whom we assumed worked for the aquarium, ordered us to follow him immediately. Leaving the lobby behind, we found ourselves led through narrow, dimly lit hallways. We passed restrooms and exited signs overhead, eventually arriving at an exit door. Our guide explained that he had to take us around to the front of the aquarium for re-entry, and it made sense, or so we thought. Our misgivings were temporarily quelled as we followed him to his car. We climbed into the back seats without hesitation, convinced that this was a part of the aquarium's process. The man instructed us to fasten our seat belts and smoothly pulled out of the rear parking lot. But when he veered left instead of right toward the front entrance, alarm bells rang in our heads. Both Aiden and I simultaneously inquired about his intentions. He remained ominously silent, his face an unreadable mask. Several seconds later, the door locks ominously clicked into place. The man brandished a menacing threat, a dire warning that if we made any sudden moves, he would kill us. To emphasize his threat, he retrieved a large knife from the glove box. We sat in paralyzed silence, our minds spinning with dread. We were just two terrified seventh graders, and he held our lives in his hands. The car sped uphill, further into the remote wooded wilderness. Panic gnawed at us as we considered the ominous detour. After what seemed like an eternity, the man pulled over, parked on the side of a desolate road, and exited the vehicle. It was a deserted area, a desolation with no signs of life, no houses, and no passing traffic. He ordered us to remain in the car, his knife held threateningly. With bated breath, we watched as he walked away, his intentions unclear. We exchanged whispers, attempting to formulate a plan for our escape. Though we couldn't speak openly, Aiden gradually slid over to my side of the car, where the door remained unlocked. As the man returned and opened my door, he made a dire threat, compelling me to step out. I conveyed a subtle message to Aiden, urging him to remain in the car. The man was unaware of our quiet communication. As I left the car, my heart pounded, and I found myself walking into the woods with the stranger, a knife concealed in his pocket. Fear pulsed through me as I heard Aiden sliding into the driver's seat. Moments later, I urged him to flee, and he sprinted downhill, leaving the man in the dust. The man attempted to pursue us on foot, but then, to our sheer terror, he hurled the knife in our direction. It missed me by mere inches, clanging against the ground. I didn't pause to retrieve it. I just continued running downhill, following Aiden. The man ceased his pursuit and soon disappeared. We miraculously made it back to the aquarium, sneaking back into our class, unnoticed. Mr. Russo, engrossed in his relaxed teaching style, remained oblivious to our absence. As we grew older, the encounter haunted us, leaving us with lingering questions about the man's sinister intentions. Although we could only speculate, we chose to keep the incident to ourselves. 
what purpose would it serve to disclose the details of a traumatic experience that would likely remain unsolved? The incident remained an unsolved, chilling mystery, one we dared not revisit. To this day, we avoid revisiting those dark memories and pray that the shadow of that sinister man remains forever in the past. During my time in middle school, our curriculum embraced the notion that field trips held immense educational value. These excursions enriched our understanding of the world beyond the classroom, and it's a perspective I wholly endorse. One destination that remained a constant on our annual field trip agenda was the zoo. It didn't matter where we went for our other trips, the zoo visit was a perennial event. In my seventh grade year, as the school year drew to a close, our class embarked on the much-anticipated zoo adventure. Our zoo wasn't the grand, metropolitan keened, but rather a smaller yet, respectable establishment nestled amid a forested backdrop. Although not the most extravagant or extensive, it enjoyed a notable reputation within our community, attracting a modest but steady stream of visitors. Our seventh grade class comprised around 40 eager students. We moved as a single unit, following the predetermined path, but the cumbersome size of our group meant we couldn't explore every corner of the zoo in a single visit. My friend Carson and I, driven by youthful curiosity, devised a crafty plan to chart our own course. During the trip, we would casually break away from the group, affording ourselves an opportunity to delve into uncharted territories. Our heads were meticulously counted at the beginning of the trip, during lunch, and upon its conclusion, a system that provided ample leeway for our rogue escapades. Thus, we embarked on our self-guided adventures, straying from the group without detection. Within the first ten minutes, we artfully detached from the main group, venturing into various sections of the zoo. At the close of this secret session, we seamlessly rejoined the group, ensuring our inconspicuous reintegration. It was as if we had never ventured off in the first place. This covert operation unfolded with impeccable precision, providing the confidence to undertake a repeat performance post-lunch. Despite our slower pace, we managed to explore areas we had yet to visit, including the intriguing bat enclosure, the zoo's star attraction. The bat enclosure, cleverly designed to mimic night and day, was a dim, cavernous realm. During daylight hours, only dim black lights illuminated the space, creating an atmosphere suitable for observing these fascinating creatures. A dimly lit cave entrance led into the heart of the exhibit. As Carson and I explored the enclosure, I couldn't help but feel the eerie ambiance of the exhibit. Despite being in the midst of a bustling zoo, it was uncannily dark, with only a few other visitors sharing our space. The bats hung from above, their nocturnal presence accentuating the mystique of the moment. As we scrutinized the intriguing creatures, a sudden forceful grip on my arm jolted me from my reverie. I spun around to find a zoo employee clad in his work uniform. Startled, I attempted to understand the reason for his intervention. He admonished us for touching the glass, an accusation unjustified as we had been cautious not to do so. With an air of authority, he instructed us to follow him. Obediently, we trailed him through dim, winding passages that seemed to stretch infinitely. The faint, eerie glow of an exit sign eventually signaled our escape. Our guide ushered us outside into the light of day. The world outside consisted of dense woods, eerily quiet and remote. A lone car sat beside the building, its trunk yawning wide open. Our sense of unease escalated. Our confusion deepened as the man beckoned us to the vehicle, leaving us with no alternative. With mounting trepidation, we entered the car. He instructed us to strap in, then set off without explanation. Despite his unwarranted actions, we maintained hope that there was a logical explanation for his behavior. However, moments later, the car turned in the opposite direction of the zoo. Panic enveloped us as we realized that something was terribly amiss. The situation began to unravel, and the pieces of the puzzly did not fit. To make matters worse, our attempts to exit the vehicle proved futile. The car unlocked from the outside but sealed itself upon closure. As we continued on this perplexing journey, a growing sense of dread filled the air. 
we reached a desolate location, devoid of houses or signs of life. The man ordered us out of the vehicle and instructed us to follow him. Beneath the shadowy canopy of the woods with a knife concealed in his pocket, the man led us deeper into isolation. I felt a shiver run down my spine, uncertain of the intentions that lurked behind this ominous escapade. I noticed Aiden edging toward my side of the car, where the door remained unlocked. He was preparing to escape. In a whispered exchange, I implored him to be ready to run when the time was right. Summoning all my courage, I suddenly yelled, Run, Aiden! The moment was upon us, and we bolted, leaving the man in our wake. He attempted to pursue us on foot, but the dense forest shielded our escape. He resorted to throwing the knife, narrowly missing his mark. We ran for an unknown duration until we could no longer hear our pursuer. Our legs ached, our hearts pounded, but we had left the danger behind. Eventually, we emerged from the forest, encountering a fence. It was a fence that held the promise of rejoining our group. In a desperate leap, we crossed over, returning to the safety of the zoo. Exhausted and breathless, we reunited with our classmates. Remarkably, we slipped back into the fold, our absence unnoticed by the others or our chaperone, Mr. Russo. Our secret escapade remained concealed. In the days that followed, the incident continued to plague our thoughts. A few days later, I received a text message from Carson. It contained a group photo of our entire class taken near the zoo's entrance, just before our departure. A message accompanied the image, bearing a bone-chilling directive. Look in the top left corner. I scrutinized the photograph intently, and there, in the top left corner, stood the man. The man who had tried to abduct us. His presence in the photograph sent shockwaves through us, and we were forced to confront a nightmarish reality. It was irrefutably the same man, his face clearly visible, and his chilling gaze directly aimed at the camera. The implications of this discovery were haunting. The man in question was no ordinary employee, as we had initially assumed. The reality struck harder and deeper, a sinister presence concealed beneath the veneer of a uniform. Our decision to keep the incident hidden was a matter of self-preservation rather than selfishness. We understood that exposing the truth would likely result in reduced opportunities for future field trips. In the face of a traumatic experience, we chose to keep our ordeal a closely guarded secret, our hopes resting on the belief that this man would never cross paths with other unsuspecting children. In my eighth grade year, the highlight of the school calendar was our much anticipated field trip to Washington, DC. The prospect of an excursion with my friends was enough to spark excitement throughout the class. And the moment we stepped off the bus in the nation's capital, we were filled with a sense of adventure and discovery. Amid all the preparations and excitement, our class of roughly a hundred students was divided into three separate groups, with each group further divided into clusters that matched our hotel roommates. This arrangement would ensure that we explored different attractions throughout Washington, D.C., including monuments, parks, museums, and local eateries. After a long weekend of visiting educational sites, our teachers had a special treat for us, a colonial ghost tour. The tour was a twilight walking adventure through some of America's most historically significant sites, winding past village cemeteries and old townhomes. I've always been uneasy about anything related to ghosts, but I reassured myself that nothing supernatural would occur during this tour. The guide reiterated this point, assuring us that it was more about the history and storytelling. As we wandered from colonial home to cemetery plot to another colonial home, I became engrossed in the historical narratives our guides shared. They recounted stories about homeowners and their lives in these preserved properties. I wasn't much of a photographer during the tour, but some of my friends took snapshots, hoping to capture the elusive ghostly orbs that some believed could be seen in such photos. My friend Jessica, who was my roommate during the trip, was not among the avid photographers. She occasionally snapped a photograph, but preferred to listen to the stories and soak in the history. As our group approached a small two-story house with an eerie blue hue to its windows, my curiosity was piqued. 
the guide began recounting the house's history, which added to the eerie atmosphere. It had once belonged to a man and his beloved wife. The couple was overjoyed when they learned they were expecting a child. Tragically, the wife died shortly after giving birth to a baby girl. The man was consumed by grief and grew to resent his homely daughter. He isolated her within the house, continually berating her for her appearance and finding her a suitor. Listening to this tragic tale, I felt a profound sadness for the girl who endured such suffering in that house. Her only reprieve seemed to be the quiet hours she spent upstairs, using her skilled hands for sewing and weaving. Moved by the story, Jessica took a photograph of the house and we continued on our tour. However, it was the next house that led to a chilling discovery. As Jessica reviewed the photographs on her digital camera's screen, a glimmer at the second floor window on the right caught her eye. We both stared at the photo, zooming in to examine the scene more closely. To our astonishment, three figures were visible, peering out from the window. On the far right stood the spectral outline of a woman, her presence undeniable. A taller man stood behind her, partially to the side. Strangely, a third figure appeared to be a woman, but her features were less distinct. Her body was visible, but her skin was not as translucent as the other figures. It was an eerie and inexplicable sight that sent shivers down our spines. I couldn't help but wonder about the identity of these apparitions. While the first two figures aligned with the tale of the father and daughter in the previous house, this mysterious third figure remained an enigma. My curiosity got the better of me, and I raised my hand to ask our guide if there had been another person living with the family in the house we had just visited. The guide seemed taken aback by my question, but offered an answer. Yes, during their time there, they had a black female servant living with them. This revelation left us in stunned silence. The third figure in the photograph remained an unexplainable presence, adding an unsettling layer of mystery to the already eerie tour. As we continued through the colonial streets, the ghostly encounter remained etched in our minds, casting an enigmatic shadow over the remainder of our trip to Washington, D.C. During my formative years in elementary school, I had the privilege of residing near a pair of well-known state parks. The school often utilized these picturesque natural settings for field trips that aimed to impart knowledge about plants, wildlife, and the wonders of the great outdoors. I fondly recall one such trip from my first or second grade days etched indelibly in my memory. A school bus transported my entire class, roughly numbering between 50 and 60 children, to this serene haven. The abundance of kids certainly presented a challenge in maintaining order. Nevertheless, the trip commenced without incident, and our journey through nature's classroom began. As the day progressed, we reached the pivotal moment of lunchtime. Famished, we devoured our meals, eager for the subsequent playtime at the playground adjacent to the eating area. The playground mirrored those found at conventional elementary schools, complete with swings, slides, and jungle gyms. Not surprisingly, as soon as I completed my meal, I dashed to the playground with an insatiable desire to explore and play. Perched alone on a swing in the remote corner of the playground, I scanned the tranquil woods beyond, my curiosity peaked. The other kids were still in the process of savoring their meals, leaving me with an abundance of time on my hands. But alas, there were no playmates in sight, so I patiently swayed back and forth, observing the natural surroundings. As my gaze lingered among the trees, something unusual caught my eye. There, concealed partially behind a tree, was a man in his early fifties, covertly observing me. Upon my discovery, he playfully emerged from behind the tree, feigning amusement at my having caught him spying on me. In his hands, he held a camera, which he promptly began using to snap pictures of me. I quizzically inquired about his intentions, to which he spun a tale of being employed by a magazine company in dire need of fresh cover photos. Despite my young age, I was easily persuaded and fantasized about gracing the front cover of a magazine. The friendly conversation soon took a sinister turn as he delved into inquiries about my personal life. 
His questions extended beyond the innocent realm, venturing into dangerous territory. He sought to know my home address, my parents' occupations, their contact numbers, and even my social security number, a query to which I was utterly unequipped to respond. Nevertheless, my childish innocence compelled me to offer the limited information I possessed. Trusting his fabricated narrative, I could not perceive the malevolent undertones lurking beneath. At this juncture, the man divulged that he had forgotten something crucial in his car and requested my assistance in retrieving it. Naively, I assented to his request and followed him, hand in hand, away from the playground and deeper into the forest. With each step, the playground and the other children grew increasingly distant. The encompassing trees created a canopy of solitude, a stark contrast to the joyful atmosphere of the school excursion. As I queried the man about the location of his car, he replied with a hint of urgency, prompting us to continue onward. We ventured into the depths of the forest, my young heart pounding, and the unsettling sense that something was amiss began to take root. As we journeyed further, a parking lot materialized before us. The man directed me to a vehicle parked at the farthest edge of the lot. Opening the rear door, he gestured for me to enter the vehicle. Perplexed, I hesitated, my initial understanding shattered. I reminded him that we were merely fetching something from his car, but his tone darkened as he barked the same directive. My unease heightened as he slammed the car door shut behind me. I was now trapped within, and he swiftly circled the vehicle to the driver's seat. With a grim determination in his eyes, he accelerated away from the lot. Fear and confusion welled up within me, and my voice quivered as I asked him our destination. A chilling silence hung in the air, disrupted only by the ominous focus etched on his face. With growing dread, I repeated my question, but the man remained silent, his gaze fixed unwaveringly ahead. It was at this juncture that I attempted to exit the vehicle, only to discover that the child safety lock had been engaged. The futile struggle to open the door was a sobering reminder of my dire situation. My sense of impending danger intensified as the forest began to residay. We neared the park's exit, and tears welled up in my eyes. Frustration and panic welled within me, and a profound sense of powerlessness overcame me. Yet, just when despair seemed to eclipse all hope, Salvachun arrived in an unexpected form. A park ranger's vehicle pulled up behind us, its flashing lights illuminating our situation. I seized this opportunity and began to wildly gesticulate from the rear window, desperate to capture the ranger's attention. The man, too, noticed the park rangers and reacted swiftly. He yelled at me to lie down on the floor, brandishing a gun from beneath his seat. Frightened, I complied with his command, but the actions of this desperate stranger had already exposed the sinister nature of the situation. The park rangers approached, their presence transforming the bleak panorama. One of the officers, guided by my frantic signals, located me and offered comfort. As I narrated the events that had transpired, an immediate call for backup was issued. In the end, the man who had abducted me was arrested. I was not allowed to return home on the bus that day. Instead, my mother retrieved me from the park, her emotions oscillating between relief and fury. She embraced me tightly, simultaneously reprimanding and expressing gratitude for my safety. This harrowing incident continues to haunt me. I was saved from the clutches of a kidnapper due to a fortuitous confluence of events. If not for the timely intervention of those park rangers, my fate may have been drastically different. The memory serves as a chilling reminder of the dark corners that can lurk even in the most seemingly idyllic places. During my senior year of high school, my forensics teacher, Mr. Stevenson, managed to persuade the school to organize a field trip to an abandoned building located deep within the woods. Though he may have initially suggested that we'd only be studying the exterior of the building, the reality was quite different. This mysterious site had a notorious history, having been the scene of a significant crime, and Mr. Stevenson's plan was to explore it more thoroughly. The location was already eerie, nestled in the heart of the forest, with an overgrown, nearly invisible road leading to it. At the time, our class was studying the topic of drugs and their impact on crime scenes, 
and Mr. Stevenson intended to use this location as an educational tool for us. It was an unusual choice for a school trip, considering the building's history as a former drug den. Upon our arrival, the unsettling aura of the building quickly became apparent. It was much more intimidating up close than I had imagined. The surroundings were surreal, with dense forests in every direction, and the overgrown road that led to the building was barely recognizable due to the grass that had overtaken it. Nevertheless, Mr. Stevenson led use inside with an air of familiarity as if he had been there numerous times before, and he shared a wealth of knowledge about the building's history. It seemed that the original purpose of the building had always been shrouded in mystery, and construction on the upper levels remained incomplete, rendering it a prime location for drug deals and illegal activities. Our exploration felt like a surreal school field trip delving deep into the heart of a former drug den. Mr. Stevenson's attitude was surprisingly lax during the trip. He didn't seem concerned as a few students ventured off to explore on their own, or perhaps he was simply indifferent. Feeling a sense of adventure, my friend Gianna, whom I affectionately referred to as G, and I decided to go off on our own as well. After all, there were around eight floors in the building, and it appeared that the top floors were left unfinished. We felt confident that we would explore the upper levels and eventually reunite with the group or return to the bus. We began our ascent, climbing one flight of stairs after another. The middle floors revealed less debris and graffiti, but as we ascended further, the damage became more evident. We reached the second highest floor, and it became clear that the floors were constructed of weak and decaying wood. The top floor, however, appeared inaccessible, as the stairs had been completely stripped and broken. Determined to reach the uppermost level, we looked for an alternative route. As we navigated the rotting wood, we noticed a hole in the ceiling above. That's when our adventure took a chilling turn. Gianna pointed out the hole, indicating that she saw something. A bizarre, ticking noise resonated from above, similar to the sound someone might make to call a pet. We looked up, and an arm emerged from the hole. It was just an arm with a long black sleeve, but no other details were visible. The individual lay flat beside the hole in the floor, and the arm beckoned us upwards. Our initial curiosity soon turned to apprehension. We called out to the person, asking how to reach the top floor, but they didn't respond. Instead, they persisted in making the ticking noise, urging us to join them. The atmosphere grew eerie and unsettling, and Gianna and I decided it was time to retreat. As we made our way back to the stairs, a loud crash echoed from behind us. We turned to see a man on the far side of the room, gazing at the wall. What struck us was his unusual appearance. He didn't fit the profile of typical urban explorers. His presence felt more menacing and unstable, sending a chill down our spines. We fled the room, racing down the stairs as quickly as we could. However, as we descended, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being pursued. I looked up several times during our descent, and there he was, peering down at use from the top. Each time, he seemed closer, and I realized he was chasing us. We finally reached the bottom floor, but I kept glancing up to check if he was still there. The man had vanished, and we could breathe a sigh of relief. However, we were now far from the group. As we continued, we heard Mr. Stevenson's voice nearby. I chuckled, grateful to have made it back safely, but Gianna's unease lingered. We found Mr. Stevenson, who asked us where we had been, and we told him the truth about our eerie encounter with the man. While he scolded us for our recklessness, he also advised us to leave the building immediately. The other students who had wandered off had returned, and when we reached the bus, Mr. Stevenson conducted a headcount multiple times. Despite the harrowing experience, the trip wasn't a failure for the rest of the students. They learned valuable insights about the building and its dark history. However, for Gianna and me, it became one of the most horrifying experiences we ever went through leaving an indelible mark on our high school memories. During my college years, I enthusiastically enrolled in various art courses. These classes frequently featured field trips, 
often to art museums or, on occasion, more intricate art-related destinations. One of these excursions in particular took place during an art appreciation course and involved a weekend visit to a small town renowned for its artistic culture. Accompanied by a fellow classmate I'll refer to as Alex, we made arrangements to reserve a hotel room and set off on our journey. Our aim was to explore the town's artistic offerings and photograph designated art pieces to satisfy the requirements of the trip. It was meant to be an independent endeavor without a set group schedule, allowing us to explore the artworks at our own pace and leisure. As we embarked on our weekend adventure, we soon recognized that the town's surroundings were rather unsettling. Our destination appeared to be veiled in an air of desolation and uncertainty, but we remained optimistic, convinced that the art we would encounter would compensate for any initial unease. The first hint of trepidation came upon checking into our motel, an antiquated and dilapidated establishment that seemed frozen in time. However, it was late and no alternatives presented themselves, so we resigned ourselves to staying in the questionable lodgings. The inside of the motel room was equally disheartening. It bore the wear and tear of countless guests over the years, leaving behind an aura of shabbiness. Although we hesitated upon entry, there was no turning back at that point, and we decided to spend the two scheduled nights there, opting to focus on the art rather than the accommodations. Anticipating a long day of art appreciation ahead, we promptly retired for the night. I, unfortunately, found myself roused from sleep at an hour too early for comfort by the incessant ringing of the room phone. Confusion washed over me, for the darkness beyond the window suggested that it was still nighttime. Grasping the receiver, I answered the call in hushed tones, hoping not to disturb Alex. To my surprise, the voice on the other end remained silent. I repeated my greeting, gradually elevating my volume, but still, there was no reply, only the steady rhythm of slow breathing. Inexplicably, the conversation seemed one-sided. A sudden knock at our room's door snapped me to attention. The perplexing aspect was that the sound also emanated through the phone line. I comprehended that someone was standing outside our room, and my unease deepened. As I continued to listen, the phone line abruptly went dead, plunging me into a disconcerting silence. Startled and confused, I shared the strange occurrence with Alex, who, too, found it peculiar. We considered confronting the motel's front desk about the incident in the morning and decided to return to sleep. Attempting to dismiss the incident, I closed my eyes and made an attempt to fall back into slumber. It wasn't long, however, before I found myself once again roused from sleep, only to be met by an unsettling darkness that enshrouded the room. My mind typically played tricks on me in pitch-black settings, conjuring imaginary shapes that danced in the shadows. This time, my vision seemed to summon a dark figure, though I initially dismissed it as one of my mind's benign creations. Recalling previous instances of such visual illusions, I regarded the phenomenon with mild annoyance rather than alarm. I continued to lie still, attempting to coax myself back to sleep. Nevertheless, with each moment that passed, the figure within the room appeared to draw nearer. My imagination, a fickle and unpredictable companion, usually conjured inanimate objects, but this figure defied my expectations. Its presence grew more distinct with each fluttering of my eyelids, growing bold enough to lean over my bed. I decided to dispel the illusion, extending my arm toward the shadowy intruder in an effort to pass my hand through the imaginary figure. However, my hand collided with an unexpected resistance, sending a jolt of panic coursing through me. Startled and perplexed, I inhaled sharply, causing the phantom figure to pivot around and swing the room's door open. Reacting instinctively to my shock, I released a piercing scream, raising the alarm to wake Alex, who stirred in surprise. The mysterious intruder bolted through the door and into the hallway beyond, swiftly vanishing from sight. In our state of heightened fear and confusion, we bolted the door securely and barricaded it to ensure no further intrusion. Wide-eyed and gripped by terror, we remained vigilant throughout the night. At the break of dawn, the two of us decided to cut our trip short and exit the unsettling motel. 
We never entertained the thought of confiding in the front desk staff about our harrowing experience. In the safety of daylight, we drove away from the motel, ending our getaway prematurely and immediately contacting the local authorities. Later investigations revealed that, after the motel's shift transition, the incoming staff member had not reported for duty, leaving the front desk unattended. Seizing this opportunity, an unknown intruder gained access to the premises, making off with the personal information of multiple guests, including room numbers and a master set of room keys. The lack of security cameras in the antiquated motel and the perpetrator's successful evasion of identification compounded our distress. The breach of our personal security and privacy left an indelible impression on both Alex and me, fueling our ongoing trepidation and unease. The unsettling thought that this unknown assailant possessed our personal information continues to cast a shadow over our memories of that weekend trip. The incident serves as a stark reminder of the vulnerabilities that lurk in even the most unexpected and obscure corners of the world.